Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're here actually to talk about a really important topic. When you think about the life of joining a startup and looking for a job, we're going to talk to some of the experts who have startups. And actually, Almer is not really a startup. He's been in the market for a long time with Souk.com, but he used to be. And so he's going to really um, help us learn from his experience on what it takes to attract and retain talent and what is the image of a startup. You're competing now with the companies like Facebook and Google and Uber and Kareem and Twitter and LinkedIn and all the big companies that are now in the region taking this talent that has to do with startups and technology. How do we retain that talent for the startup industry and what can we do as an image of the of the whole region and the startup life as a brand um, to retact, attract and retain them. So let's go around just kind of ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, what does it take or how would you describe the startup life as a brand? Is it something that people really are excited about joining on a startup because it's easier than joining a corporate, it's more fun? Or is it seen as more work and long hours and, and really not that attractive? What do you guys think about that? The image of a startup in general in the Middle East. Nether, do you want to go first? Ludo. Okay. Um, I, um, when I started Nabish like, almost four years ago, um, startups weren't really something attractive uh, at the time. I mean, it wasn't, there wasn't an ecosystem for startups. I think now uh, it's becoming much more interesting. There's, uh, there's much more money being invested in startups. So actually, startups have a higher chance of success. Uh, there's a lot of money in, in Lebanon by the governments. Uh, I'm not sure about Egypt, but there's a lot of money in the UAE, Kuwait, and so on. So I think um, we want, we're all betting on suit.com to, uh, to exit so that we can have, uh, you know, a billion dollar, uh, a billion dollar success story so that it, it becomes more and more successful. But uh, it's, it's getting there. It's getting there. It's, I, don't, I don't think it's um, very attractive at the moment. But, um, but uh, it's doable, like we are able to get great talent, but the way we do it, it's not, we don't sell like the salary uh, or the insurance and the benefits and all of that. We, we sell more like the vision and the, the freedom. And people like, uh, what I find is that great talent, they like uh, the fact of being empowered to take decisions. So when you say, you know, you know, you're a business development director and you're going to have like an impact on the success of the business. That's something that people find very attractive. Okay. Um, I think that uh, there are a lot of activities, you know, like, like Rise Up, they are branding, you know, like uh, the startup environment in general. But I think that uh, most of the employers, the startups, they need to brand themselves. Uh, and actually, I'm thinking uh, about Jobzella as an experience. You know, that mo most of the startups they go to Jobzella, create a company page, and they post the jobs, but they don't engage with their followers. So they need to do a lot of efforts to brand themselves as employer of a choice. So why I should work for your company? So if I'm a developer, I'm searching for a PHP developer job vacancy. I can find hundreds of job vacancies. But why I should join your company? The problem with that startups till the moment, they are not doing any effort to brand themselves as a startup. So uh, corporate on the other side, if you are talking about like big companies like Facebook and Google, everybody wants to work for Facebook and Google, not because of the package or the salary, but because of the work environment. They are doing a lot of effort to brand their companies, to brand the environment, to be recognized as an employer of choice. And this is what we miss in the Egyptian startups you know, scene. So uh, they need to do a lot of effort. Uh, the package and the salary, yes, but you know, uh, you know surprisingly, uh, I, I, I face many startups, they are paying much more than the corporate, and uh, many jobs. Sometimes I advise my customers to pay less salary, so it's not about the salary, actually in Egypt, I'm talking about Egypt. It's not about the salary itself, but it's about, you know, if you, you have to engage with your team, you know, to share with them your vision, your success, to be very transparent, so if they believe in it, they will they will not think about the salaries, they will think about the success story behind what they are doing. They will feel like some of my teams are saying that we are part of a dream. So this makes them stay whatever the salary is, you know, for a while. Yeah, selling the vision and the dream and the passion is a big yes. part of getting them to attracting them. Exactly. Omar, tell us about your experience and what you think the startup brand is about right now today. So I think um, at Suit.com we kind of aspire to try as much as possible to remain uh, perceived as a startup and kind of live as a startup. If anything, I think uh, the image a startup has is 
not only a lot cooler but a lot more fun and a lot more dynamic and like Nether mentioned I mean if you're able to brand that correctly um, in, in, in a fashion that's engaging uh, people tend to uh, to have a lot more loyalty um, within the organization if they feel that they are indeed part of it um, I think you know when, when, when we look only three years ago we were uh, 28, 28 people in the office um, and I can tell you we we were treated as a startup actually till today uh, we're still kind of treated uh, when it comes to recruitment as a startup and they say you know why would I leave you know this multinational and come join you know some Arab company and and and, and we tend to see that a lot and and we're glad with that but uh, I think uh, going to the part of whether it's relaxed or, or, or more comforting, I think um, all companies and especially startups are at least what we try to perceive ourselves as is uh, no, it's not that it's relaxing so much as it's, it's part of a lifestyle. Uh, and we try as much as possible to hold on to that lifestyle uh, to let people, yes, feel comfortable, but feel comfortable in the sense that you can bring your home to the office not feel comfortable that you know you can come and leave at any time essentially yeah well um yani yeah, my experience with uh, with uh, hiring has mostly been shaped by my previous job at IT works uh IT works had a very uh, uh technology centric heritage um and uh, what what really uh uh, I would like to share is that the the first few hires, the first hire, two hires you make, uh, really uh, um, help define the company and uh, and and will dictate uh, what happens uh, over the over the coming few years. So uh, so with IT Works, uh, we put a lot of effort in our first uh, two, three, four, five hires. Uh, we wanted to hire really just the the absolutely top notch, most technically excellent. Uh, people in Egypt and uh, we we got fortunate with that and we had a very very strong initial team uh, and then it the company got branded as being somewhere where you could only get a job if you were really technically proficient you're really one of the top engineers in the country um, and this initial branding served us really well because then uh, top engineers would uh, would flock to the company and would apply, uh, and it helped us maintain uh, this branding and this uh, um, this idea that uh, you wanted to go to IT Works if if uh, if you really had the the technical chops. I think one of the the things, especially in the Middle East region, that we a lot of people when they graduate or when they're working, they they care about what their parents they tell their parents where they're going to go work. So do the parents say to themselves, oh, you're going to go work for a startup? No, you have to go work for something more stable in a company. Do you guys find that happening in the region now, that parents are worried about children going to work at, or their kids going to work at startups, or no? Actually, I think that some parents, they don't understand the job description of their son, kids, you know, like uh, social media specialists, what is that? SEO specialists, uh, animation specialists. So most of the job vacancies that we see today were not available five years ago. So for them, everything is, you know, is unknown. They don't know it. You understand me? Like wh what I am saying is that most of the job vacancies that are available today in the market, they were not known five years ago. So uh, five years ago, you cannot find the job title called uh, um, marketing uh, social media specialist. They don't know what the social media specialist is doing. They don't know what is the software developer. They don't know what is like SEO specialist. So in general, they don't know what they are, uh, they are doing as they don't understand it well. In the same time, you know, most of the families, I'm talking about Egypt especially, uh, they think that uh, they want like a bank job, you know, like an uh, oil and gas company, a big multinational company. They don't believe in startups, you know, they are not. But when they see the startup is doing success and growing day after day, they feel proud about their kids. What is the uh, biggest um, challenge to attract and retain talent? Talk to us about your experience at Souk. What What are the things you're doing as a strategy to not only attract talent, but to keep them as part of the company once you've kind of invested in them? Right. Um, so I guess one thing that um, we actually failed miserably on in the beginning and, uh, and was fortunate enough to finally learn it, and I don't think that I learned it in any of the ventures before, which is kind of why we failed initially in Sioux, was um, actually the importance of investing in HR. Um, 
when we started uh, ramping up Egypt, um, and actually as an organization, we actually reached uh, a, a, a thousand uh, employees without an HR department, um, which was uh, a bit weird, uh, to say the very least, yeah. And we thought we had everything, you know, that we thought we were, were on par, uh, and quickly realized that actually we didn't have um, certain infrastructures that are required, um, such as uh, you know a sound appraisal on something objective more than subjective, um, and uh, as a result, without you know all these performance management systems and all these things that sound really complicated, but they're actually quite simple when you kind of willingly take a deep dive into it. Um, you end up without those things losing some of the great talents because they, 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 they it becomes very frustrating when you don't have something uh, to gauge uh, someone's performance on uh, and whether they do a good job or a bad job uh, it's all kind of subjective uh, and that tends to have a very derogatory um, uh, conclusion if you will so what we've done afterwards and quickly kind of learned was heavily invest in in, in HR um, and, uh, and 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 build some competencies. And by competencies, I mean it's just understanding what what your values are as a company, what you're trying to do, and 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 what your objectives are, uh, and and building from that. What are you looking for in a person? So all we did was basically HR manager, myself, and the team kind of sat down and said, okay, well, what do we need from this person? What do we need from this person? What do we need from this person? We just kind of mapped it out, and it's actually a lot simpler. I mean, it was done in a cafe. I mean, so it's it's not something that's a aggressively you know intimidating or anything and from that we had a performance management system from that you have a score of four from that you do a monthly review with everybody everybody knows where they stand what they're doing what they're doing right what they're doing wrong and the people that are good stay because they feel they're part of something where they're properly appreciated so you talk about retention attaining them like how do you attract them so uh, to be honest on that one it's 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 again not complex systems or anything um, we tend to find that the people within the organizations are truly the ambassadors of it and 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 till today we're, we're over 3,000 people 635 in Egypt um, the vast majority have all been done on referrals um, and and people recommending the company and 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 truly buying into the to the concept and it's only when they feel they're part of it and that they're properly appreciated and invested in in terms of growth and development by whatever means you have uh, I mean budgets were obviously significantly different three years ago but as if they know that that you're properly investing in them with everything you can whether it be financial or non-financial uh, there's a certain level of appreciation so I want to talk about your model, Lulu, because it's really interesting. You, Nebish, is a website and a platform for freelancers to come together. So if a client needs a freelancer, you provide them. And you also, you know, help these freelancers find work. Do you find these freelancers are using this as a platform to, to create their own business? Once they get enough freelance jobs, they'll become a startup? Talk to us about your experience. Um, I just met uh, this lovely lady, Sarah, right? Radwa, sorry. Uh, Radwa um, stopped working in a, in a full-time job, became a freelancer uh, on Abish, and now she has her own company, and she's hiring freelancers on Abish. So I, I just heard the story now, so uh, this is a perfect example of how uh, freelance can become, you know, uh, the, the, the stepping stone to potentially to entrepreneurship. If you're very good at what you do, and obviously she is, uh, then you can grow the business and you can hire, you know, you can use the community and, and get more done and bid on bigger projects and become an entrepreneur. So uh, there are, I've seen, I've seen a few other uh, stories. Uh, similarly, we have another lady in Saudi Arabia as well. She started uh, something in education and she was a freelancer on Nabish as well. So uh, yeah, it happens. Do you, do you guys have, you use it, you think you have a, your springboard for startups to take to happen? I mean, have you seen a lot of this kind of success story take place? Um, not a lot of them, but I think, again, it's a, it's a stepping stone, like, into, into entrepreneurship. Like, for us, for example, we, we hire a lot of freelancers at Nabish. So if you're, if you're a small company, you need, really, you need to, like, you can't afford, you know, to have a big team on a full-time basis. So you need to outsource some things. You need to get experts to do certain work. So... Uh, so yeah, and as we grow as a, as a company, uh, the freelancers will grow with us as well and potentially become uh, job creators themselves as well. 
Good. Well, uh, you work for Sawari Ventures, which one of the companies that owns is Flat Six Labs, mm -hmm. and you mentor companies that are becoming startups so that they can be invested and to grow. What is the advice you give startups on, on focusing on talent? What do they need to do to get the right people in their startup, and what do you look for? Yeah. Um, so I think at, at the bare minimum in terms of, uh, in terms of talent, uh, we, we look to, f to make sure that there is the company has someone who can build the product and someone who can sell the product. And, and we think of that as really the, uh, if, if you had to distill uh, all the competencies and skill sets uh, to the bare minimum, you would need uh, to find a builder uh, and a seller. And once we uh, we f identify that the builder and sellers both both exist, uh, then the rest of the team and the rest of the competencies can uh, can kind of be built around them. Um, we see it as a big red flag uh, if one of these two pillars uh, are not there, uh, and we also see it as kind of a red flag if the, if they're both same person. I want to talk a little bit now about work environment. I am an ex-Googler. I worked there for almost four years. It was a great place to go to work, and they take really good care of their employees. Um, but work environment has a lot to do with attracting talent and keeping them. Uh, I think on some of the plus side, they think startups, like I was saying, more relaxed. It's a more easygoing environment. You can come to work in tennis shoes and jeans, but you also work really long hours, and you wear a lot of hats. Talk to me about the work environment in a startup and what that plays into factoring to attracting talent and keeping it. I'll give a quick example. Like, uh, as, a, as a founder of a, uh, you know, a small growing company, we currently have a team of 14 people. So I actually make it a point that we, that we do a lot of like, social activities together. It's, um, I think it feels very much like a, like a family, uh, to be honest. Everyone, um, you know, everyone uh, engages with everyone. Everyone knows what uh, the others were up to over the weekend. It's 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 very much, um, you know, people that care about each other. And I think when you have a thousand people, obviously, it's difficult to, to keep this happening. But it's uh, it's so important uh, to make sure that you know everyone feels that if they don't perform well or if they you know don't do a great job, then they're gonna you know their results are gonna impact everyone else. Uh, and and it helps you know, to get everyone together. So for example, um, every, every week we have a, like a full team meeting because I have some people that are remote as well. And everyone has to share like what they're doing. So the sales team have to say their numbers, the marketeers have to say what they've done. The tech team has to say like what they've built and so on, and which creates a sense of accountability. Because if you messed up on your sales targets, all of your colleagues are gonna know that basically you're not doing your job. and. It's basically me managing without really having to, to tell them. It, they just feel guilty in front of their colleagues. So sharing information is very important and making everyone included as well. Like a lot, of, I see in a lot of um, startups or, or maybe bigger companies, they have silos. Like the tech is alone, the sales is alone, and, and so on. With us, we try to explain like because the sales guys think like, what do these engineers do all day? And then the engineers think, okay, these guys just you know are on the phone and what do they do? So. We put them all together so that, we, so that they can all understand um, how important each and every one of them's role is to the success of the, of the company. Uh, from our experience with Jobzell, uh, one case happened that uh, we had two months. We had some challenges to pay for the sellers. So at this point of time, it was very expected that some people will leave, which we didn't happen. So, uh, and the main reason behind this was the engagement and transparency, you know, because we are, we were taking some steps and we are, were always engaging our team in those steps. So they saw the progress. And even during my discussion with the investors, every time I go to a meeting with an investor or take any step with the investor, I was communicating this with my team. So this was really a good reason why they stayed with us. They believe that we are going to make it. It was a tough, tough time, but we believe that we are going to make it. So they stayed with us, and most of them, they are still with us. This was two years ago. Uh, another thing is that, uh, besides the engagement and activities, uh, the company culture. Uh, we build our values by ourselves as a team. It's not like something top down coming from the management that those are our core values, or we just Google some core values and say we will pick five core values. It's not like this. We build it together, you know, like uh, from the experience, we see some 
um, problems with some colleagues, so we, we try to fix it in a certain way, and then we come with a rule that this is our value, that we cannot do this and that. Uh, like respect, we have to respect each other, so you cannot pass this line. Uh, another thing is that we want to like make things in the best way. We endeavor, we are doing a lot of effort to do everything in a perfect way, so we created another value that we read about, and then we discuss it, and then we make it our value the wow factor, that we don't just do things, we only do wow things. So it's not about I'm doing 10 things, I want you to do one thing, but it has to be a wow thing. So this is also makes, you know, everybody feels that his, it's his own company, you know, like uh, this is my company, this is my value, this is my culture, you know. So this is also something helped us to retain the good talents. Another thing is that uh, sometimes if you want to hire a good person, especially someone who is expert, experienced, you know, and you cannot pay a lot for him, you have to give some equity for him. This is also one of my experience because I wanted to, uh, to uh, hire my manager at my previous employer, and he is very senior, he is older than me, he has a lot of experience, and he is an, uh, really an added value to our company, and uh, I offered him equity in my company just to be part of it, and he accepted it. So this is also, if he feels ownership, he will remain with us, you know. So sometimes you need to give some equity. Uh, uh, well, uh, Omar, anything to add on the work environment? Yeah, and, and uh, actually I'll uh, just uh, uh, talk a little bit more about equity, Any since, uh, since Nader brings it up. Uh, clearly, uh, equity is, a, is, a, is the key currency that startups own, uh, especially when, uh, when trying to recruit uh, senior talent, right? So it's um, it's very common to have uh, these uh, equity-based uh, employment offers and using equity-based compensation in, in early hires. It's also something where we see uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, it's easy to make mistakes when, uh, when, when you're doing that math. Uh, you need to uh, think through uh, your equity scenarios. You think you need to understand um, as you give equity away, um, whether that is scalable as you want to continue to grow the senior executive team or not, you also need to structure it in such a way um, as to think about uh, the separation cases, right? So uh, you're bringing talent on board and some of, some of them will eventually leave and you need to have thought about uh, both the, the onboarding of these people and then what happens uh, if they choose to leave and what happens to that equity and how to manage it. Um, so as, as a very key and effective tool that equity is, uh, we, we often see it uh, misused or at least not very well thought out and it's a common pitfall in, 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 in hiring for startups. Uh, I am what about dilution? I mean like uh, you can set a certain equity for your employees that is not going to be diluted in the future? Yeah, I think uh, I mean uh, this and many other aspects of, uh, of the rights associated with, with that equity uh, has to be thought out uh, early on, especially that you're typically making those decisions early in the, in the lifetime of the company and you probably don't have access to all the legal counsel and mentorship, etc. Uh, so it's something that you need to be careful with uh, when you're doing it. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, um, yeah, equity is definitely a, um, a, a, a good buy-in, um, but as you said, it needs to be very, very strategic in how it's issued. And it's not just on like which positions make more sense. I mean, at so there's over 280 people with, with stock um, within the family. Uh, but it's not just issued to like heads and directors and things like that. It's actually issued to the people that help construct the values, as you mentioned. Um, we have you know, a couple of weird quirks where, uh, I don't know, I mean, you have, uh, like, the head of fashion has to be, and like, anybody that joins uh, uh, suit, uh, at least here in Egypt, has to sit as a uh, CS agent for two weeks, regardless of position, to just kind of understand the customer and understand what these values really mean. Um, but they're also vetted on the interview process uh, by, like, a picker or packer uh, that probably understands the value of the company better than the vast majority would. So certain positions of director could actually one of the the interview panel can be somebody who picks and packs some of these shipments so it's really tying in that family part i definitely agree with you in terms of having everybody aligned um even if it's just like a quick quick scenario um, we have a daily you know 
nine o'clock everybody gets two minutes just kind of say what's going on nobody replies whoever's late has to kind of dance and and do weird things but all in all i mean i guess google is probably one of the best uh in guidance on that and we tend to google you guys a lot on it <laughs> so do we have any questions from the audience before we wrap up i'll kind of do some concluding remarks on what everyone talked about any questions do you guys don't want to learn how to get a job at any of these companies? Just ask them. Get a job. <laughs> Hisham, do you have a question? Omar, how's it going? Hi, Maha. How are you? I actually know the panel, so how are you guys? Um, I didn't. I just came, uh, but uh, from what I understand uh, about this, I uh, wanted to ask because you're asking how do you get jobs at these companies. I'm more interested. How do you get uh, a collaboration with these companies? How do you collaborate which, with your companies? That's my question. Which company? If you want to get a job, at the, go to Job Seller. They are hiring through us. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I'm more interested in, in cooperating and. Uh, collaborating with these companies and uh, creating uh, content for these companies. So I would like to know how would I would do that. Don't do that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay. I think, I don't know, maybe the specific companies can talk to you afterwards about how to talk about cooperation. Um, uh, we're specifically trying to just take on the topic of attracting and training talent, but I'm sure you can sit with them. Dealing with content is going to take a little bit longer than we have, unfortunately. Any other questions for the panelists? When do I know that it's just maybe contrary to the panel? But when I know, when do I know? Just, just close your eyes. Okay. When do I know that this man is uh, he's talking about the talent not management and not right now? Is that when do I hire people? Okay. So the question he's asking is when do you know when you don't have the right talent in your organization? When you should know to fire them? Um, who wants to take this question? Well, go ahead. Yeah, no. Why are we all smiling, by the way? No. Uh, so, so actually, I, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think of this as, as two problems, right? Um, first, there is uh, your core jobs. Uh, so uh, Omar sp spoke about uh, the, the pick and packers uh, at ITWorks. These were software engineers, really the core uh, worker at your company uh, who is doing the role that you that your company the core competence competence of the company and uh, for that role uh, you probably uh, will have developed uh, KPIs metrics tests uh, benchmarks you will have comparative data so you'll have if you're doing your your, your your job right you will have no doubt whether someone is performing or not because it's uh, it's a role that is central that you probably understand very well as an entrepreneur yourself that you have uh, comparative performance data across many different employees doing the same function, uh, that you have training and development programs for, you're able to measure someone's progress, you're able to measure their productivity, their efficiency, their error density, everything about it is measured and it's easy to identify someone who's not performing. And it's just a matter of making the decision and letting them go. So this is the easy part, the, co the core jobs. And then you have jobs that are not non-core to your company. So uh, let's say, w what business are you in? Yeah, so you are in the service provisioning business and you have someone in uh, accounting, for example, right? And uh, because you are in a service business, uh, accounting is not your core competence, so you have no way of telling whether this guy is good or not uh, and whether... Um, 
you can get someone better, or the problem is with the job description, or the rest of the organizational function, or maybe uh, the problem is that you don't have a procurement function, but it's reflecting in accounting, so y you really have no grasp of the job and how it should be performed. Uh, and there, I think, uh, this is what you need to solve first. So you need, uh, as an entrepreneur, to go out and meet someone else who, is, who you know is doing this job, you know it, he's doing it well, uh, talk to them, understand it, understand what the job entails, what the problems are, what the performance characteristics are, then you're able to make a determination of whether your own guy is doing a good job or not, or whether he's the right person for the job or not. And this is much, much more difficult for these non-core positions than it is for the core positions where you, you know exactly what you're doing. We have time for one last question. Go ahead. Just go ahead, we'll repeat it. We'll hear you. I think we can hear you. What do you look for when you're hiring? You're following company culture or skill sets? What do you think is more important? Um, I think having somebody uh, very uh, talented in a particular skill is great, but initially as a startup, uh, you need more of generalists, um, people that understand and see the same vision that you're looking at. So definitely from a competency side, say you're a service provider, somebody that really gets customers and, and, and things of that nature, uh, far more than that particular skill set. Um, definitely invest anything and everything you can in them. I mean, uh, when we first started, there was almost a dozen people that were getting paid significantly higher salaries than I was simply because we needed to bring that best talent. But that best talent, in my opinion, definitely should be on the generalist side because you're going to wear so many hats. And, and, and if you just look at, for instance, somebody for coding, well, you're going to need to be HR sometime. You're going to need to be accounting sometime. And you need to be able to figure that out. So I'd definitely say um, go for it for the super, like the person is super, but as a generalist. I want to share something like uh, uh, because you know, the first employees who joined Jobzilla they are still with us uh, and I want to tell you my experience about this because you know what, what we were doing is was new in the market and would, nobody had the know-how and knowledge to do it so I was treating my first hires as investors you know how you go to investors and how you convince the investor and how you try to make the investor passionate about your business and how you make them engage and invest in your company so i was treating my first hires as such you know like i was going to them i was explaining the concept i i i knew that they don't know anything about the technology so we have to learn and study but i want them to be passionate about what we are doing so this is this was my first case to hire two good developers who can understand the concept who can have the passion about it and share the same cause and vision together and then we kept them till today three years so uh, it's not about the competences and our skills it's about the passion uh, if i have someone in my team who lost the passion i'm going to fire him and answering your question so the, if he, they have the passion they will do all the work they need to do so they have the passion, they understand your vision, you communicate with them frequently, honestly and often, and then you keep them that way. If they lost it, just let them go. You know, I have this, this case with our chief technology officer. After three years, he felt that he wants to do something new. So we, I just discussed this with him. I told, I told him, okay, no problem, you can leave the company and we are in good terms. And after a while I came to him, I said, okay, I have another startup, come with me to the other startup. And he came with me and the other startup. So if they understand what you want to do and he believes in you, he will do everything for you. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but it's a really important topic. I mean, just to close on that point, we talk about passion and profit. And if you get people who are passionate, they will help you get the profits. So I think it's a very good point to make. Um, the startup industry, I think, in the region is thriving. I think we all wouldn't be here today if we didn't agree with that. Uh, it helps uh, employers ca and the employees are empowered. They feel like they have a sense of ownership in the company. The work environment it lets them feel like they're part of a family, so it has a lot of benefits. But I think we all agree the startup industry needs to do a lot more to make sure we can attract and retain that talent and I think successful startups is a really good way to do good PR for the industry to start up and we thank you all for coming today and my panelists thank you for your contributions we really appreciate it thank you